Okay, this is part two of session seven. This is the first section on warnings. And in this, uh, we're gonna stick uh, in Matthew 7, the warnings that are in Matthew 7. In the next section, we'll, we'll, we're gonna go outside of that. So in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 27, this is the warning section of the Sermon on the Mount. And there are three warnings and a parable. So the first warning is the warning of the wide and narrow gate um, and wide and narrow path. And that's verses 13 through 14. And we'll look at each of these momentarily. Warning two is to watch out for uh, false prophets. And I'm going to add teachers to that. They certainly would have thought about it that way um, at that time. But it's um, both of these sort of equally can uh, can lead us astray. And that's verses 15 through 20. And then finally, warning three is that many, uh, I'm, I'm going to put it this way, many believers, in quotes, are turned away. And that's verses 21 through 23. And then finally, a parable of the two foundations, verses 24 through 27. So that's our section. That's how it's divided up. And, um, you know, different Bible versions and translations are going to divide these things up differently. This is how I'm, I'm doing it. And I, I believe this is really the way in which to understand these sections. Um, all right. So let's do the first one. Warning one, the wide and narrow gate slash path. Here's our, here's our verses. Enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So first of all, the, the world's way, that's that knowledge of good and evil that we've talked about, it's, it's an attractive path. In fact, it's, it's uh, many different attractive paths, and it's followed by many, right? So, so when, he's, when he says, you know, the, the, the wide gate and the um the broad way it's it's that that's the way most people are looking at and going oh that's the way i want to go right and that's that's really again that's the world's way it's the, the that knowledge of good and evil way and people look at it and they want to go that way god's narrow path or gate is the only way that leads to life. L look at what Jesus says here. He says that um, the, the broad, narrow way leads to destruction. Many enter it. But the narrow gate is the way that leads to life. And uh, so, in other words, that narrow path, it's the only way. All the other ways, they all lead to destruction. This one way leads to life. And, uh, and that narrow path, as we've seen, is obedience to God's reign and rule. Like you enter into the covenant and you, uh, you, uh, um, you enter into his reign and rule and you obey it. That is the way. There's no other way. So warning one is a warning to follow Christ and not the world. And so this would apply to both Christians and non-Christians, right? It's a warning to non-Christians. You know, if you, if you don't follow this way, if you follow the world's way, that's the way that leads to destruction. And it's a warning to Christians. If you put yourself on the path, but then you go over to the wide path, you're, you don't stay on the narrow path, you're headed to destruction. All right, let's look at warning two. This is watch out for false prophets or teachers. And so our section here is Matthew 7, 15 through 20. So let's read it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. 
Okay. So first of all, understanding that, you know, what is it, you know, what is a prophet? What is a teacher? Um, they speak for God, right? So this is basically, you can think of this Christian leaders, they're speaking for God. And, and, and so we're, we want to keep that in mind that that's what we're talking about here. And then Jesus gives us a test that is a test that's not about what they're saying, right? So a lot of people think in terms of you know, watching out for false teachers or prophets in terms of what they are saying, right? But that's not the test that Jesus gives. And this is an important distinction because it's possible that they're, they're giving a message that in your mind, oh, that's a, that's a false teaching because you were taught something different. But you may be dead wrong that other person may be correct in what they're teaching. And so if you were to evaluate them as a, a false teacher or prophet based upon the content of their met, the interpretation of a scripture or a particular theology or something, that is not the test that Jesus has given us for, is this a false prophet or a false teacher? So the fruit, this, the, is the life that they're living. Are they living out these kingdom principles? And, you know, when we look at them, are they, uh, is this a person who is um, poor in spirit? Is this a person who cries out to God? Is this a person who's humble? Um, who, is this a person who's merciful? Is this a person who tries to make peace amongst people and, you know, that, that kind of stuff? Or do they have, uh, characters like that, well, they get into fights with people and um, they, um, you know, they're, they, maybe they've got some, some pretty serious character flaws and, and stuff like that. Maybe they're, they seem to be teaching a good message and they seem pretty nice most of the time, but you keep seeing these indicators that there's some bad fruit there, right? And so the because Jesus says there, if you're seeing some bad fruit, you, you know that the tree is bad. You don't really need to know a whole lot more about the tree, right? You saw this fruit, you go, mm, that's, that's pretty bad. And so it doesn't even really matter if what they're teaching is true. They are a false teacher. Think about that for a minute. Jesus is saying they're not a false prophet or teacher because they said something that wasn't true. Not to say that you couldn't have that situation, but he's saying if their behavior does not align with um, the production of kingdom character, then you can know what's really going on the inside of that person. I like to call this um, windows to the soul. That you're, you know, you're seeing little things about a person and their character come out in, in these little fruit kind of ways, something that comes out of them. And it gives you insight to what's going on inside them, because obviously none of us can know what's going on inside of another person, barring them telling us. Um, truthfully, or a, a revelation from God. So just normally, I can't tell what, you know, what's going on in your heart and mind, right? You may be saying one thing, but thinking something else, uh, you may be motivated by something that I don't even recognize or uh, understand, all those kinds of things. I can't know the interior that's going on in your soul. But I can see that outward stuff, right? I can see that, you know, wow, this, this person pretty much, you know, they, they easily lose their temper. I, I feel like their message is correct, but they, they easily lose their temper. That person not, that this person does not need to be a teacher. I don't need to, I shouldn't recognize them as a teacher. And here's why. Because they lead people to, to, to destruction. Remember, Jesus is warning us that you're, you, you have to go down the path of obedience. You have to actually do these things, right? And these people are going to lead you down the path of disobedience. And it doesn't matter if they're teaching you 
right theology. If they're not living out themselves, the kingdom characteristics, if they're producing bad fruits, then they're headed to destruction. And anybody who's following them is in danger of being led down that same path. Now, let's move to warning three. Many believers are turned away. So these, these are progressive, by the way. So you, you see, you have two choices. You can go this narrow path or you can go this wide path. Wide path is the world's way and there's lots of different paths and it's an attractive path. Just like Eve looked at the fruit and saw that it was attractive, right? To something to be desired. And, and so she went down that way with, with Adam and that's the way the world goes, right? But God's way is this one way. So you need to make a choice, this way of obedience under his reign and rule. There's your choices, right? And so then, all right, so we need to make that choice. Then we're told, but watch out for these false prophets or teachers, um, because if they're producing bad fruit, they're going to lead you down that path of destruction. And then warning three is going to give us the, the you know, some serious consequences, things to really think about that we need, we need to be um, sober about these things. So let's read the section. Seven, chapter seven, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. So a, a quick note on Lord, Lord, that first, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. It's important to understand that when a person says, Lord, Lord, it means that they're saying, hey, you're my Lord. Uh, I, uh, um, I am your servant. I'm underneath you, you know, that, that sort of thing. I'm going to follow you. And, but he's saying, you know, it, if they're saying it, but they're not doing the will of the father, then it's just lip service. And, and that's not, you know, that's not what's going to happen. If they're not following him, then they by default are practicing lawlessness. So Jesus is talking about people who definitely consider themselves to be Christians. These are people who have had the Holy Spirit. And that, I, to me, I, I call this the scariest two verses or three verses in, in the whole of the Bible, that these are not un, unbelievers in the sense of non-Christians, right? These are actual Christians. At least they, 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 certainly thought of themselves. They said, Lord, Lord, they said, I'm going to follow Jesus, but they didn't do it. Right? They didn't, they didn't actually obey him. And then they're going to say, but wait a minute, we did all of these things that are Holy Spirit things, prophesying, casting out demons, performing miracles, right? These are, they were actually doing the, 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 these things of the spirit and they were living out what they believed was a Christian life, but it was in terms of these religious actions or these spiritual manifestations of power and, and those sorts of things. That's who we're talking about. But, um, but they weren't obedient, right? And Jesus, when he says, I never knew you, the core, the opposite of that is also true that he knows us when we obey his commandments if we want him to know us in other words we have a relationship with him it doesn't come through things like prophesying and casting out demons or any other religious activity it comes from actually doing what he said to do right actually obeying his commandments actually obeying these the, these commandments of, of character and, uh, and living out and fulfilling the law. In John 14, uh, verse 15, and then I will skip to verse uh, 21, 
John writes, Jesus is saying, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. All right. So if you don't keep Jesus' commandments, you don't love him. Verse 21, the one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. So here we see that not only if we don't keep Jesus's commandments, we don't love Jesus, but if we keep his commandments, we show our love for him. And more importantly, we will be loved by both him and the father. In John 14, verses 23 through 24, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will follow my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. The one who does not love me does not follow my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. So we see again that it, we have to actually do what he said in order to love him. In order to be in relationship with him and the father, we actually have to be in an obedient relationship with them, actually faithful relationship with him. It doesn't mean that Jesus is expecting perfection from us. It doesn't mean that it's we're in some sort of you know, scientific situation where if, um, you know, if, if every element of your being, if every thing that you ever do is not uh, perfect, then you have failed and you're out of the kingdom, right? We're not talking about that sort of thing. We're talking about relationship, right? That I am, I am striving to be faithful in the relationship. The marriage is no different. People in marriage mess up all the time and they argue and fight at times and they have to make up and have to say they're sorry and forgive one another and those kinds of things. They, by faithfulness of the relationship, it means commitment to the relationship, right? And in this case, our commitment to Jesus follows from our obedience to his commandments. So our commitment needs to be to his commandments and, and we've seen all of that in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Another thing I want to say about this, this last piece is that, um, you know, many people believe that, that manifesting the Holy Spirit is the proof that you are, quote, unquote, saved. But that's not really true. And, and we've seen that here. Jesus says that's not true, right? And, you know, if just because you did those things, it doesn't mean that you get in. If you were not in a, a faithful relationship with him, he doesn't even know you, right? And if you weren't striving to obey and abide and remain in his commandments and coming back, if you stray, come back and, and, and that's your focus to have a good relationship that's based on obedience to his commandments. Um, so the Holy Spirit is not, is not actually proof of that salvation. The Holy, Spirit is, is, the Holy Spirit is proof that you're actually in the covenant, right? If you, if you don't have Holy Spirit, you're not actually in the covenant because the Holy Spirit is part of the covenant. We're, we'll see that in uh, session eight and nine. And that if, so it's not proof that you're saved. Proof that you're saved is remaining faithful to Jesus, especially under situations of pressure and persecution and temptation and those things. If I, I remain faithful through those things, that is the proof of my salvation. Um, and you can see that in, in first Peter. Um, but it is actually proof that I'm actually in the covenant and that, I, you know, I'm obligated to the life of, of that spirit. Okay, let's look at the last part, which is the parable of the two foundations. This is Matthew 7, 24 through 27. So let me read it. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall 
for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and its collapse was great. Okay, so first of all, just, you know, parables have basically metaphors and whatnot that are intended to make us think about something that is real. And, and they have a, a particular point that they're trying to make. So in this case, the house uh, represents your life. And the foundation represents your obedience or disobedience. And the rains, floods, and wind represent the future coming judgment when Jesus returns. So if you act on Jesus's commands, you will have a sure foundation in the judgment, right? That's it's therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them is like a wise man, right, who built a, a good foundation. So in other words, if you're acting on Jesus' commands, you're living out a faithful life in pursuit of obedience to, to those character commandments, then you're going to survive the judgment. But if you don't act on Jesus's commands, your foundation will fail in the judgment. You will not survive it. John in 1 John is basically going to call this practicing righteousness or practicing sin or unrighteousness, right? So if I'm acting on it, it means I'm practicing the righteousness. I'm practicing Jesus's commandments. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. And, I, and as Ephesians 4 would talk about, I'm maturing in Christ. I, it's a it's a virtuous cycle of getting better and better and better at it. That's what Jesus. It's just like a baby. I, when I, when you're a baby, you can't you can't run around, right? You, you first you learn to crawl, then you learn to to wobble around, pull yourself up, then you learn to stumble around, and eventually you're walking, and eventually you're running, right? And so it's that sort of you know you know thing that that should be occurring in our lives when we practice righteousness. But if I don't really care about that very much, and I'm just continually practicing unrighteousness, it doesn't matter what my mouth says, right? My fruit is bad, and I'm headed for destruction. All right, so let's review part two. God's way in the new covenant is the only way that leads to life. Every other way leads to destruction. Second, false prophets and teachers will lead a believer, a, someone who's a Christian, who's who decided to follow Christ, if they're following a false prophet or teacher, someone who is bearing bad fruit, it there, there certainly is the possibility, if not the inevitability, of leading that believer to destruction. And so we want to pay close attention to how our, our leaders live. Obviously, we want to listen to what they're saying and teaching in terms of, of doctrine and you know theology and that kind of stuff. But we want to pay more attention to their character of the Beatitudes. Are they living those out? Are they producing in their Christian Christ maturity good fruit? If not, if we're seeing bad fruit there, run. Do not follow that person. And then just because a person believes the gospel, calls themselves a Christian, does Christian religious activities, and even has the Holy Spirit, it does not mean that that person will enter the kingdom. The criteria for that is that we must obey Jesus's commandment of self-sacrificial love to know him and enter his kingdom when he comes. And finally, we need to build our lives based on acting on Jesus's commands, practicing those commands. And if we do that, we will survive the coming judgment. So that wraps up part two, and we'll pick up part three next.